Welcome back, everyone. Truth lies in the amazing benefits of martial arts. Still here with Alan Baker at the Atlanta Martial Arts Center in Woodstock, Georgia. So, Alan, question. Um, I would like to talk about many truths of the martial arts, but what I would like you to do first is, uh, if you don't mind, is just anything mm -hmm. off the top of your head talking about the truth about martial arts that you wish uh, more students of the martial arts knew that they may or may not know that you're, that at least in your experience and your time behind all of this, uh, you have seen, you've seen a lot of truths. You've seen, you've experienced a lot of truths yourself as an instructor, as a student, as a business owner, you know, so we can also go into that. But uh, any truths about the martial arts that come to mind that you would like to share to, to listeners? Oh, wow. Truths that you learn on the mat, between the mat and You know, let's start there. Classroom. That's a good place. On the mat, truths about learning on the mat and anything from all the arts you've done, anything that's just very insightful. Uh, well, for me, you know, the mat, uh, the, the academy creates an environment of growth. Okay. And, you know, you can learn a mantra or a new self-help technique right. and you can say I'm gonna wake up in the morning and put this information in my head and become better right that's one way of doing it but the truth is you need an environment a classroom something that you can enter into to challenge or create those moments where wisdom will come out I see so um, how do you do that you know uh, I, you can use multiple different environments. So jujitsu is a pretty common one now. Yeah. You, know, you you roll in jujitsu, you have an exchange, and you're going to be challenged physically. Right. Um, you know, you, maybe you get an opponent's 200 pounds, going a little harder than normal, and you have to learn how to deal with that. Right. Uh, and you know, there's a certain level of disappointment and failure there. Right. Which is one of the most powerful instructors ever. Mm. Um, and you know. That failure, a lot of times, I hear this a lot, you know, you need to learn how to accept it. Uh, that, that to me is just the beginning. Um, okay. what, accepting it's one thing, but the, we're also going to seek it. I think a warrior seeks the unknown. He seeks those wisdom opportunities right. that come with failure. Right. So I go to get on the mat multiple times a week. I go get that guy that outweighs me by 200 pounds and go, hey, let's do it again. <laughs> I need right. more of that truth. Yes. So help me find it. And so it takes a lot of adjustment with ego, Okay. Uh, the mental landscape. There's a lot of uh, really positive adjustments that will happen in those arenas in order to do that. Right. Um, and, and then it'll go on even farther that uh, once I start creating that environment of failure, we become wisdom seekers. Uh, we will start to challenge it even more. Okay. And like for me, um, I've got fortunate enough to have guys, they got 200 pounds on me and they'll come in and smash me. I may right. get both of them at once. And it, 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 then I'm now I'm in a situation where there is no winning. I'm right. going to fail. Right. What am I going to do about that? Am I going to keep trying? Or am I going to go, well, there's no way. I'm just going to stop. Right. Is that the right answer? And again, it can vary per individual, but, you know, uh, a warrior doesn't stop. I see. So we'll put you in that situation and you go, you, there's no way to win. What are you going to do? Right. So now, you know, you, you, you can see the truth and the wisdom that's going to come out of that moment. That must be if nice I'll to see. I'll allow it. Yeah. <laughs> that must be nice to actually witness as a teacher, to be able to observe how your students adjust or how anybody adjusts to an environment like that when they probably thought they never could. Agreed. And, th and, then, they, and then they do it, and that's got to be very gratifying as a teacher. Correct. And, and, you know, then after that, for us, like, we'll start to challenge... Uh, emotionally okay we have different ways that we will throw different things into the mix that will challenge the individual under the fire emotionally it sounds like you really care about your students development <laughs> inside too and not just their physical skills when it gets around to it that is one of the most uh, precious jewels that will come out of martial arts okay and you know it's not really taught on a lot of curriculums yes some curriculum I have it for me it was taught between class right because uh, Sifu would see an opportunity and I'd right. get upset. 
or right. I'd get emotionally tore up over it. <laughs> right. You walking off the mat with, you know, glass in your eyes, you know, and <laughs> he'd come up and go, hey, you know, what just happened? Yeah. And, you know, it's got nothing to do with that technique. What happened happened on the inside. It happened on the inside, your heart, your mind. Yeah. That's what you need to fix. Right. Um, because the chances of you getting in a fight the rest of your life, maybe one or two, depending on who you are, obviously. Right. But the opportunities to take those lessons and the passions that's created from it, the will, the spirit that's created from it, and apply it in life, go start that business. I see. And, you know, it's going to fail. How are you going to handle it? Well, I just won't do another one. No, you're going to go, you're going to keep going after it until something happens. Yeah. Um, you, you get to the point where failure is just part of the process. It's accepted. You not only accept it, you go get it. Let's get it over with quick. Right. How many times can I fail in this next hour? You, big guy, let's find <laughs> out. You know, let's just, just get on with it. You yeah. know, because I'm going to get so much information out of that. Uh, training of the spirit, passion. Uh, that's, right. Yeah. Now you got the guy that go, well, I don't want to do that. I want to look bad. Right. And that, you know, where's he going to be? Uh, right. So to me, to go back to the original question, yeah. what creates that environment? Yeah. You know, one, physically, like we said, yeah, two, emotionally, yeah, and, and, and mentally. Right. Because, you know, if we can create an environment that starts to challenge an individual on all three. Let me ask you a question now that you say exactly that. We live in this, and, and we can all sit here and agree. Me, you, Casey, by the way, I didn't say this in the beginning, but Casey's with me. Say hi, Casey. Hello. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. We talked about the mental, emotional, and physical benefits of martial arts. And we'll go more into that, too, in the amazing benefits uh, part of this. But um, we live in an insane time right now. Would you agree? Like, this is pretty crazy. You know, everything from the pandemic to how things are working out in the country and everything like that. How people have changed from when you and I grew up and what we were put through versus what kids today are put through. Exactly. And that's on the both, and what's that? Or not put through. Or not put through, right. And that's both on the positive and negative side of that. You know, um, do you feel that now more than ever, at least I do, that martial arts has a much more amazing application in, in today's world than it ever could have because of the time that we live in? Yes. Um, if people will accept it. Okay. And what ma what's so hard about that? What makes it so difficult? Uh, I think the culture change. Okay. Uh, you know, it's like what we're talking about is a lot of people would look at that and go, no way, that's abusive. You're right. That's you true. Know. And what, I mean, I don't know. I, see, this is, it's so tough because traveling across the country, we walk into schools and the hardest thing for me to do when I go in, personally, after been do having done this since 1993, that's a long time. I can't, I have to focus really hard and turn off my biases turn off my my knowledge and try to go in there with this blank slate perception like what does this look like to someone who's never seen it like can do you remember when you when you were a kid and you started this what it looked like the first time you saw Muay Thai what it looked like to you versus what it looks like today and that's what I'm talking about it just it, it was so awe-inspiring you know like when you first saw Kali or JKD or Jiu Jitsu like the first time you actually saw it for real and not on a you know, on TV or movies or, or in a magazine for that matter. Because I remember back then, the first time I saw anything was in a magazine. Mm -hmm. Or if you, like me, I would order videos off of unique publications, mm -hmm. VH, VHS videos. Is, I'm getting talking old now. But, um, but I remember going into the dojo the first time and actually seeing that uh, for the first time in person. And it was a, it was a shock. And so going back to what you said, um, why is it so difficult for people or so uncomfortable? Why is it? Because it's not uncomfortable for you and me, but why is it for the uninitiated? They're uninitiated. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Right. Answer my own question. You know, um, uh, I, I, like we said earlier, I, I grew up in that environment. And, you know, by today's standards, it would be considered abusive. Yeah. Uh, we went after each other. I mean, we, there was blood, sweat yeah. and tears, literally right. every Thursday night, yeah. uh, you know, and it was a small group. Not many people are interested in that, but, right. you know, and then it, 
it creates a fire that will hone metal. Okay. But no, I don't think ever everybody is interested in walking through that fire. I can agree with that. Right. Um, you know, and it doesn't have. You look at it and go, it doesn't have to be a full blaze, either. Right. You know, you, you can approach it and build up slow. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're discussing it from our perspective. Yeah. And, and you know it should be it, you should be able to put a volume knob on it and adjust to the individual and allow them to develop those internal skills slowly um, but not many people are interested in that journey yeah I agree because that was another thing that we stumbled upon recently which was something uh, I can't remember the, where it was in, in the, I can't remember what book it was in but this in the book they talked about the curse of knowledge and the curse of knowledge at least from this author's standpoint was you and I forget what it was like uh, before we did any of this. We forget what it looked like to us and what it felt like for the first time. Meaning, it's getting harder and harder for you and I, and I'm not speaking for you, but for you know a general standpoint, it gets harder to see through their eyes because we've been doing it for so long. We don't. We forgot what it was like to see it for the first time. Do you feel like that if um, if there was a way? To uh, educate instructors and school owners and try to look at it from their frame of reference as a business and as uh, an, an instructor to help them feel more comfortable to come in do you think that 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 would help do you think that would help at least get more people involved uh, the student yeah perspective yeah um, look for you know a good environment okay and that's what you talked about yesterday was culture. Yes, um, you know, something that you're going to be comfortable in for a long haul. Right. Uh, you know, because it's it doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. Uh, you know, and you're setting your own pace. There's no rush. I see. Um, and, and you'll you'll get to where you're meant to be, but you you know you need to find an environment that will allow that. Okay. And you know there should be good communication. Right. Um, of what you want, right? Uh, and w what you're looking for from the experience. I see. And a good teacher, you know, you you'll explain that to them. A good one will go, well, it's not what we do. We may go down the street and talk to this guy. That's mm -hmm. what he does. Right. Um, so uh, maybe that will. I mean, I I appreciate that that commentary because we've gone to schools where we walked in and. And they, we're, this is what we're wearing. We're not wearing martial arts clothes. We're just wearing our regular street clothes. So they don't know us from anyone. And we walk in and it could be the culture that's uninviting. It could be that we're just not greeted. Like I remember walking into uh, at least a dozen places where nobody said anything to us for like half an hour. And we're just standing there. And we're going, okay, well... In some cases, you try to be considerate because you're like sometimes it's it's a one man show, yeah. you know. So I we, we I always move those off to the side. I'm not going to include those guys because it's hard. If you're trying to open a school and you're doing it on a shoestring budget, you're a one man show. So that's not the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, where there's clearly more than one person uh, that works there or that's teaching in that, you know. Um, so we've had some bad experiences with walking in and either. Uh, not feeling comfortable to be there because one nobody's talking to us or when we do walk in We just get this really strange look like who are these people? And we're going and I'm like do they know me? The have they seen eye. me before? I don't know do they have any and so <laughs> yeah, we're getting the side eye We're getting that whole and I know they don't know us and they just have this very territorial you know behavior and that's kind of something I wanted to go into do you feel that um, That there is a little bit too much of that in the martial arts world that territorial sort of you know it'll vary per individual slash academy right you know it depends it goes back to the top you know because right. that's that's the person in charge of the culture right um and that's why you say culture is so important to try to observe when you right when you walk in yeah you know what kind of environment and what what type of culture is it? okay um, can you elaborate on the kind of culture that you would at least look for as a student, um, I'm welcoming. Okay. Uh, clean is one that we, you know, get a lot when you go in. Right. They care for the place. Right. Um, respect. Yeah. You know uh, that has to exist uh, because it goes both ways for your entire journey. 
Um, you know, I, I would say look for someone at the head of the ship mm -hmm. that is a student themselves. Oh. Take a look. Are they still training? Are they still studying, seeking knowledge? Uh, you know, it's not always fun to know the coach is out of town right. training with his instructor because, man, I want him in class. But right. if he is, that's a good thing. That yeah. means, to me, that is a living school. Uh, if, if the guy doesn't continue training on the regular, it's a dead school. Uh, hmm. And on the regular, I, you know what? He should be seeking knowledge once a month. That's and what, his job. And what would happen if somebody unknowingly uh, found themselves in what you say is a, is a dead school? Um, what would be the, the cons to that? And what would be the, the result of that if you happen to... And you don't know. You know, you're walking in, I'm, I, you know, you try it out, you sign up, you know, you get moving. Is there something that they'll be able to... That they could tell over time that would tell them that this is a dead school? Well, to me, it goes back to what we discussed previously, and it's the combat blueprint. Okay. Are you getting the answers you need? Right. Then you may be. In, in, in that case, it might not matter. This guy has the answer in this area, and right. I really like it. It seems effective, and when I test it out, it works. Yeah. So, therefore, I'm going to stay here and gain that wisdom and knowledge. Right. Now, I may also go, he doesn't have what it what I'm looking for in this area, I may go find it over here in that guy. Right. And, you know, it's, uh, I, for me, I seek out instructors that are also students, and they also train. And they're also uh, what, what I refer to as a son teacher or a son student. I see. Now you got two personalities in martial arts, the moon student and the sun student. Hmm. The moon student reflects life. That's the instructor that says, this is how I was taught it. Just like this, you do it this way. Hmm. He's ref reflecting light. Then you're going to have individuals that are creative. And they're sometimes shunned, at least in the first half of the cycle. Yeah. And then 10 years later, they'll be considered a genius. Right. That's a sun student. He creates light. Okay. And for me, that's the type of instructor I want. And it's not always the head guy. See, that's very insightful because I've never even thought about it like that. Right. I've, I've Several times I've went into organizations to look for information and found out that guy number two or guy number three is the one that is the sun student. <laughs> and so I may not necessarily spend a lot of time with right. the grand poopa. I may sure. end up training with his second in command. Right because he has that creative spirit and he's testing it, he's doing it, he's out in his backyard training every day and he's creating information. He's the guy who goes, well, I learned it this way, but when I do it this way, it works, watch. Right. That's, that's what I've always wanted, right. uh, you know, because to me, that's truth. Right. You know, now, not that both sources are valuable information, right. um, it, but, you know, to me, it goes back to, in the academy, are you, getting the information to build your equation. Right. Okay. No, I, I, that's really good. I've never thought of it like that. You know, I, and now I'm probably going to be seeing that constantly. I'm going to be, you know, identifying that pretty quick because I've never, I've never looked at it like that, that you've got, you know, the people that are reflecting what they've done and known versus the people that are creating. Um, and of course, you've got pros and cons of both sides. And, uh, but for the beginning student, when they walk in and they see this culture, like you're saying, and the school is clean, the instructors are inviting, they're being greeted, you know, they're actually getting what they uh, wanted, or maybe they're getting stuff that they didn't know they wanted. Uh, but they're getting, they're, they're getting either what they wanted or what they needed. And those are good schools, in your opinion, where, whereas some of the other schools like we've seen, uh, and this gets defended all the time. And I don't know why they vehemently defend this, but I'm I'm trying to help people understand that, you know, let's say you walk into a dungeon, like, and, we, and we've had this experience, we walk into these, these complete dungeons, you know. Usually they're MMA gyms, okay? Usually, the, you know, it's just a bunch of guys just sweating, bleeding, you know, these are fighters, these are guys, and I love those schools too. Um, but they're extremely intimidating for your, your uh, uninitiated or beginning student. So when they walk in, they get this shock like what you know what is this i don't know if i want to do this and so um uh but even in a school like that they could still find what you're saying that reflective oh, or yeah. that creative and yep. so that would immediately turn that school that looks not so inviting into 
if they can find that, if they can see that from the beginning, then it would be kind of like, well, I don't, now I don't care what the school looks like because I've got these guys that uh, that can help me. Is that kind of... Well, it's uh, one thing about the dungeons. Right. Is it's a testing ground. Yeah. You know, um, regardless of what piece that thing together, they test it. They right. try it out. Uh, and they're wisdom seekers. Right. And now they may only do it in one set of rules, but they are doing that. Right. But that's sometimes, sometimes, all they do. Right. And so for me, I'd, I'd like a school that's going to be a source of knowledge okay. and information, but also has the ability to create those environments of challenge on different levels. Right. Like we said earlier, there should be a volume knob. Right. I'm not just going to throw you in the cage with my best guy, and you'll never come back. And we have seen a lot of that, especially on the on the the fighting side, the MMA gym side, and the jujitsu side. And we've experienced it where it's like they just throw you into the lions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so certain that that's the best idea for your first time student walking in. You know, they come in, they might learn one one or two techniques. And for the last half hour, they're just rolling and getting killed. And that's a really intimidating experience. And some of them make it through it. A lot of them don't because they're like, okay, I did not sign up for that. I don't know what that was about. But And then the instructor will say, well, that's how we do things here. And um, do you feel that there should be more considerate approaches to how... Uh, to how that takes place with your beginning student. Not only consider it, there should be an organized plan for it in the okay. school. Gotcha. And all the students should know that plan. I see. Because they were treated that way, and now that they're a big brother, and they're introduced to their younger brother, right. you pass that on. I see. That's right. And and it, there's, it should be like an SOP okay. for the student. Here's how you behave. Here's how you right. introduce yourself. This is how you shake hands in the beginning, and okay. these are the things I say. Which goes back to culture, what, is what you were Correct. talking about. Correct. You know, what is your culture... Just slap and tap and start, or do they ask you specific questions every yeah. time we get on the mat? Do you and actually have, show concern right, for you. Right. Do yeah. you have injuries, past or present? Hmm. Now I want to know what's wrong with you now, and I want to know what's wrong with you 10, ten years ago because right. I don't want to bring the past into the present. <laughs> the, what percentage do you want to roll or exchange at today? Right. And it is the elder student's responsibility to maintain that. So if the other guy gets a little rowdy because right. he's new, you can just tap him on the shoulder and go, hey, you're getting a little rowdy. That's what that means. <laughs> right. There's plenty of time for that later, but uh -huh. we don't want, I don't want you to damage yourself on me today. Yeah. So calm down a little bit. Right. So they, Leadership. Right. They have to have the ability to do that. And that should be how it happens every time someone rolls. That's part of the culture. It's part of the exchange. And, and it creates a good educational environment for the guy that's never done it. Right. Right. Which means it. Go ahead. Oh, I just had a question. Um, do you have a way to bridge the gap between what a student thinks they want and then what they need? Like they come in thinking that they want one thing, but you can see that it's just like, well, you need this whole other thing over here. And like, how do you? So for me, like, yeah, I reference the combat blueprint a lot. Uh, it's a lecture that I put on um, for program design, and I introduce that. That's one of the. Um, philosophies of the academy. So we'll say, look, this exists outside of systems. You know, if you don't have an answer here and you're okay with that, that's okay. But now you know this exists. Uh, so I usually will introduce them to that and, you know, make you aware. So some people, you know, they'll go, well, I just want to grapple. Okay, perfect. But you know these other things could happen in a combative exchange right. and you make the choice. So. Due to that introduction, sometimes they'll go, well, where do I learn that? Go, well, the beginning of that journey is right over here, maybe on this class. You know, uh, and if you're looking to start this over here, maybe you'll go to that class. They have some ideas. So, Last question. So uh, last question, and, and if you have one more truth that you want to share, anything at all that, um, that came to mind earlier, uh, share that. But my other question is, um, in the martial arts world, we'll just say in the martial arts business world, right? There's a lot. It's hard. It's really, I, I know because I've had three schools, it's extremely difficult to try to get this thing off the ground because not a lot of people do it. And so you're, you're really trying to bet on certain things to make it all work. You know, you're, you're, you're hoping that you get your marketing and advertising right and you're, you're trying to just get people in the door and, you know, get things taken care of. Is there any truth on that front that 
you would also like people to know about as an owner. Arts, as an owner, as a, as a, as a, as a business and as a business owner, anything at all that you. In any industry, you know, you're going to have the pop dream. Okay. And uh, in any industry, the majority of the money is made by selling that vision of the pipe dream. Okay. They chase the carrot. Right. And you'll chase the carrot for a certain amount of time and realize that that's got nothing to do with actual success in right. any given industry. Right. Um, yep. <laughs> but you're saying the pipe dream. So like, yeah. So um, well, like when I coach guys in this industry, one of the things I'll tell them is, you know, chasing the carrot is I'm going to have 600 students someday. And, you know, they'll hire coaches that will say, look, here's the information. You implement it, and someday you'll have 600 students. Right. The truth is there's it takes a special personality to get to that. I really agree with that, and yeah. I'm really glad that you said that because that's a huge one. Like, you see these school advertisements and stuff all over the place, right? Right. Oh, uh, do A, B, and C, and then you'll get X, Y, and Z result. Yeah. Meaning, you know, you're going to have three to 600 students. And I'm like, wait a minute. Have you seen the statistics? Like, less than half of the state of Florida. You know, I think the, the statistics are basic for martial arts schools, like how many schools are in the U.S. It's less than, I think, 15,000, 16,000 in the entire U.S. Um, and the, the number of participants that actively participate in martial arts in the U.S. are less than, it is less than one and a half to two percent of the entire population, which is about 370 million people. So if you were to put that on a graph, it would look like less than half the state of Florida <laughs> that actually participates. And but yet we still get these these uh, organizations and schools that want to perpetuate. Oh, have this many students, and you know. But I feel like what they're not addressing is a lot of stuff that we just got done talking about, which is you guys got to get the first thing right, which is how are you how are you going to make them feel when they come in the door? You can advertise to them all day, but as soon as they walk in and they don't feel comfortable, they're out. Well, still, you can get all the things right and never reach the magical numbers right. that are written on the carrot. Right. So uh, when I coach new school owners, one of the things I tell them is you're going to build multiple revenue streams. Right. And, um, you know, in my experience coaching other guys into this industry, it's been successful almost 95% of the time to the point when what I mean success is they become – full-time martial artists okay. and they have freedom to do what they want. Yeah. So with that in mind, you're, it's better to look at what you do and figure out how you're going to create multiple revenue streams right. based around at least what you do. I see. And you know, um, if you back out, because a lot of times, you know, I want to be in this industry and I get so focused on the academy and I'm 10 years later, I look around and wow, I don't necessarily have the life I want. Right. Start with a thousand mile view. Okay. Build that life blueprint first, and there are certain things that you're going to look at to build a good life blueprint. One of them is finance. That's one area. Yeah. Under yeah. finance, you're going to need at least four different revenue streams. Yeah. One of them is your academy. That's just one. Right. And so you also have to create it in a way that's not going to consume all of your life units. Right. You know, I still want to get up and do what I want to exactly. be able to do every day. Right. So. If you can go through that perspective and then build it in that way, then you're going to have something in 10 years that's going to not only benefit you, but it's going to benefit the guys that are working for you. Right. Um, because they are wanting that same experience. They right. want to be successful. They want to have freedom right. uh, and enjoy the culture and environment that it has to offer. So. Right. Well, thank you for all that. Uh, stay tuned, everyone. Uh, we're going to come back and talk to Alan about the – Lies of the martial arts and the amazing benefits all in one because we're kind of running out of time, but it's going to be a great conversation. Stay tuned.